Well, in the garden life today, it's all about not things to do, but things not to do. Five don'ts for your late summer garden. And what I'm gonna do is just, just go through the entire list of five things that you should not be doing when the temperatures are this high. So when I looked at our 10 day forecast, there was nothing under three digits and it escalated all the way up to 107. So definitely there are things I'm going to want to do but there's also some things I don't want to do. Stuart, what do you say? Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, since I have so many more flowers in the cottage garden that I had at my other house, I am discovering new challenges. And I'm also discovering some practices that I should not do. And let me tell you exactly what I mean. So I have lots of deadheading to do. For example, these gorgeous butterfly candy bushes. Now, I've got my favorite pruners out here and I will make sure to put a link below because these are perfect for deadheading, which I am doing a lot of. And you can see that they're perfect for kind of exacting deadheading, where I want to clip out the dead flower, but I don't want to disturb the side buds, which will produce the new blooms. Now, because this butterfly candy bush has so many dead blooms on it, because it's been so hot, I might be tempted to get my shears out and just shear the entire shrub instead of, of oh, oh, the more laborious picking them out or deadheading them off one by one. But I am not going to do that. Do not shear anything back really hard right now. Whether that's your perennials, whether it is an evergreen, even my annuals, I may be cutting them back slightly, but I'm not doing a hard shear on them like I might have done earlier in the season. Now, why is that? because it's going to be 107. And if all of a sudden I strip this shrub of all of its protective clothing, all of its protective foliage, and just expose tender, tender limbs and new growth to that brutal sun, it is gonna suffer for it. And it might, in all likelihood, it might die because it's not only protecting uh, protecting the foliage that lies just a bit underneath it, but it's also protecting and cooling the root ball. So one thing I am not going to do is a lot of hard shearing right now. Maybe take off a little bit to make it look presentable, but I am definitely not gonna get out there and be overly aggressive. Now let's move on to my second don't. Now I know it is so hot outside and we really don't wanna be out working in this weather. It's actually not even wise to be doing that. Nevertheless, don't get lazy because if we let our gardens go to rag and ruin right now, we're gonna pay for it later. So don't forget the things you can do now to beautify your garden. Don't plant something new. Don't plant something that's not going to be able to put down a really good root structure and get established. But also, don't forget to do what you can do, and that is good grooming. So there are a number of different things that you can, write, you can do right now that will keep your garden looking presentable. So don't get lazy. Make sure that you continue to mow and edge and weed and deadhead and do all of those things that make your garden look groomed, look nice, look tended, and look at its best despite the fact that it's 100 degrees outside. It will not only make the garden look better, it will make you feel better. Let's move on to the next don't. Well, this may be one of the hardest things not to do. 
when the temperatures are so, so high and our gardens just look kind of pitiful and they're struggling in the late afternoon, the foliage is wilted. Um, things look, the plants literally look as if they are gasping for air. And there is such a temptation to get out there and over water. But please do not do what I do. Do what I say. <laughs> and don't over water. There are a number of plants over on the opposite side on Autumn's Edge that have the most brutal exposure. They get full south sun, full east sun, and even some west sun. It is the most, uh, most heat stroke prone area of my garden. And I am always tempted to overwater because things look so stressed. They look like they're dying. And indeed, they might be dying, but not just because they're so hot, but because perhaps I have overwatered that area, thinking that I was doing them a favor. So instead of immediately, you know, like a cowboy drawing its gun to shoot, <laughs> immediately, you know, don't think you've got to pull out your watering wand and go for it. What you want to do first is you want to check to see if indeed it is thirsty or if it is just like you bedraggled and worn out by the sun at four o'clock in the afternoon. So what we want to do first, there's a don't, don't over water, but here's a do do water. You guys know this, you're good gardeners, but it always bears repeating. Do water at the base, at the root zone of the plant itself. Now, what I like about some of these watering wands is that now not only do they have a shower setting, an angled setting, a jet setting, a cone setting, all sorts of things, but look, they now have a soaker setting. So I can really calibrate that heading, that uh, my, my hose end sprayer head to just the tension that I want and just the amount of pressure. And then if I've got anything that really seems to, to need it, and how do I know it needs it? Because I'm gonna stick my finger down into the soil an inch to two inches and see if it's dry. If it is dry down to that depth, then I know it needs a deep watering. And a deep watering is most effective when it is very slow over a period of time, when it's directly at the root ball. And over the course of, say, an hour, I will not only position it in one place, at the root zone, but I will then come out later and position it on the other side. So I make sure that I get the 360 entire root zone and also that any additional water will go out into the surrounding area and also help hydrate the other plants. Now, you can do this with I would suggest doing it with things that are really, really good investment plants. So if you've got a tree, if you've got um, a new topiary like this one, and even though I have drip on it, there's so much more transpiration when it gets so hot out that things are drying much more quickly than they would normally, especially on days when it is not only very, very hot, but it's very, very windy. Things can really dry out quickly. Their foliage can look very, very desiccated. Stick your finger down in there and see if it's really, really dry. And if it is, then give it some additional TLC. Now, is there a lot of TLC to be had when you've got a brand new garden that's getting established? Absolutely. So I'm really trying, boy that's a big old truck for a Friday. I'm really trying to spread the love and spread my watering out around the garden and I'm going to do it for example, for this tree, I am going to do it at about the drip line of the tree itself. I will move this around to make sure that I get absolutely every point on the compass of its root zone. 
and then I may still miss some things. But nevertheless, I want to make sure that what survives these extremely high temperatures are the things, forgive me if you will, but that cost the most money. Those are the things that I really want to make sure. So I, I am definitely going to spend more time and more resources and give more attention to protecting my trees and my topiaries than I am probably uh, those annuals that were 99 cents for a six cell pack. So, you know, it's a lot of it is just common sense, but it's also taking the time and be willing to get your index finger dirty. <laughs> um, and you can't wear your glove um, and just stick it, you know, stick it down into the soil to see what really needs your attention because we don't want to over water and add insult to injury, adding root rot on top of the stress that's all, that they're already under from these really high temps. Well, if you are a gardener in August anywhere, then you are a hose wrangler. And can I just once again sing the praises of this lightweight metal hose? I cannot tell you how much I love this hose. In fact, I now have backup hoses just, just for these. I bought one for hubs that he could take up to his uh, storage unit when he needs to hose things down. It truly is lightweight and it truly does not kink and it truly does not catch on things nearly as badly as other types of hoses. And so I, I cannot shout its praises enough. So if you are one of the few people on this planet that have not heard me talk about this hose, I am equally as enthusiastic about it at the end of the season as I was at the beginning of the season. It does say, it does, it really says a lot. And definitely I've got, I've got this in my order on repeat. Now, one thing about being a hose wrangler that I have, again, this is another case of do what I say, not what I do. It's part of that tidying up and good garden grooming. And that is after you water, put your hose away. Now in my defense, I am often interrupted uh, by somebody who comes to look at the garden or just by interrupted by life in general as I'm watering and then I forget and I don't put it up. But I am gonna try to be better about that because anything we can do to just make our gardens look more groomed when otherwise it doesn't look its best helps. So here is a tip that I wanted to share with you. Now at the fairy tale house, I had those giraffe hose reels and, and I do love those. And we will put a link to the giraffe hose reel below, which is an automatic retractable hose link. I'll put up a, a pick. Okay, Stuart will put up a pick. Um, and you just kind of tug on it and it automatically rewinds it. Now I did love that and I had places there where I could hang it on the wall that weren't real obtrusive and so I could use that kind of mechanism to put up my hose. I don't have that luxury here at the cottage. Anywhere I would hang it, it would really be too obvious or it just wouldn't work because of the angles that I have here that are unique to the cottage. But I have come up with another solution that I think is a great tip. So Stuart, follow me over here. Now for a while, I had right underneath my faucet, I had a big black tub, just like the one you see here. I had a big black tub. It sat on a great big stone and it is what I kept my hose in. And it worked fine, except that whenever I would take the hose out and I would be watering, then I would knock over the pot. I would dislodge some things and it just was kind of a hassle. And now we have helicopters. In case you are new to this channel, and if you are, please subscribe, <laughs> please click the like button, please share this content with others. Um, if you are new to this channel, you may not know that I live in an urban neighborhood about 
five minutes from downtown in a very active neighborhood, which is one of the things I love about it. But consequently, it can sometimes be, be a little bit noisy, but I digress. Okay, so back to my plastic nursery pot that kept falling over. And then I had one of these, oh, Linda, why didn't you think of this sooner, aha moments. And that is I just dug a big hole and I recessed it into the ground, which was very easy to do. Smart, it doesn't topple <laughs> over. It doesn't topple over. I don't have the need for the great big piece of flagstone for it to sit on. And in addition, from a distance from the street or even from Lemon Lane, you can't even see that it is here. No, I had to go all the way back there. Yeah, to be able to see it. So it's just, it's just a great place where I can store my hose or my hoses or um, my hose and fertilizer sprayer. I can store it all in there and you can't see it. Now the next thing that I need to do, now that I have recessed that into the earth and I like it so much better, is I need to bury and make it at surface level my little paver that comes off of Lemon Lane to get to the faucet. And I will dig out a template of that and I will put that at ground level so I don't dislodge it whenever I water and dislodge myself by tripping on it. So that's just another just another little watering tip that I wanted to share with you and it leads me to my question of the day. What is your best hose wrangling tip that you can share with us and with everyone. Make sure to please comment below. Make sure to read other people's comments because you might have the perfect solution for someone who is really struggling um, to keep their garden hydrated and to keep it looking its best at this time of year. So please do that and Stuart, uh, let's move on to the next don't. Well, here is another temptation to avoid. Right now, I am, I am just so ready for it to, to restore its previous beauty, the way it looked like uh, a month ago at the beginning of the season and what I anticipate it will look like again when the temperatures moderate. And so you, I, all of us might be tempted to force out new blooms by fertilizing. Well, do not fertilize right now when it is this hot. And why? Well, just like, um, just like our own skin has to be tempered to the sun and get used to intense heat and intense sun, the foliage of our plants is the same. So if you fertilize right now, if you prune right now, which also will force out new growth, then that new growth, that new growth will come out of the existing structure of the plant and it is tender. These are tender little baby leaves. These are tender, it's just tender new growth. And all of a sudden, it comes out of the womb of its stem and it is just exposed to 100 degree temperatures and high winds and it immediately dies. And you don't want to stress the plant in that way. Also, you don't want to stress the plant further by saying, okay, it's 100 degrees, we're in a drought, it's high wind and nevertheless, I want you to keep on working. I want you to keep on pumping out flowers. It's just trying to survive. The garden is just trying to survive right now. Don't, don't try to, to compel it to be beautiful as well. It is just like us trying to make it day by day through the heartache that is August. And so let it just try to survive. Don't try to force it into blooming more, into growing more. 
all it wants to do right now is persist. So whether it's with um, a soluble synthetic like miracle Grow or something, or it is what I typically use for my in bed or in the ground in bed plants, and that is a, a liquid or a granular organic. You don't want to be you do not want to be fertilizing right now. Another reason you don't want to be fertilizing now and putting down really any kind of granules is because it's so, so dry. So all of that granular matter that you are putting down, let's say you put down fertilizer um, on, on your lawn and you're trying to get it to green up again because it's kind of turned brown. Well. You cannot water it enough for those granules to dissolve and do what they are intended to do, which is penetrate the soil and get down at the root zone. You would have to, to water way beyond your budget, what your budget allows. And so don't put any kind of granular out right now that is just going to sit on the surface of the soil and not do anything. That's not good for your pets. It's not good for the insect or regular wildlife. Um, and it's really not good for you because those just sit there and they don't leach down into the soil and they become overly concentrated and that is not good for your soil either. So do not fertilize. Another don't? Well, Stuart, let's go to another area. And speaking of negative Nellies, somebody made the comment on last week's video, I had on some short boots and they said, oh my goodness, who would wear boots when it's that hot outside in the garden? Well, I would, <laughs> especially if there are rusty nails and there's all sorts of debris and I saw a possum this morning. So there's all sorts of reasons I might want to wear boots in the garden in this heat and especially uh, when they are as cute as these Mary boots. Um, and I think they just cheer me up to wear bright yellow boots with a vibrant blue shirt in August when it's 107 degrees. Well, I am going to continue to be negative Nelly with my list of don'ts. One thing that I learned over the past couple weeks is don't worry about the aphids that are on my milkweed because I did quite a bit of research on this. And interestingly now, I don't even see the aphids anymore. They were caught, I, Purdue University came out with an article and I called them specialized aphids that weren't on, that a, appeared this time of year, they were not on anything but the milkweed and they said pretty much they are harmless and just leave them alone. Now, the reason that I wanted to leave them alone is because I have been coming out and I have been looking for some of those, hello, the telltale signs of swallow, swallowtail caterpillars. And I have seen some on them in very, very, very nascent forms. They're just itsy bitsy, but I have seen them on here. So even if I tried to do something, even if it was organic, like a hard jet of spray or something, I'm not only going to dislodge any aphids, but also any of those tiny, sweet little caterpillars that are trying to turn into a butterfly. So I am not going to worry about that. Likewise, I am not, if I see pretty much signs anywhere else of let's say spider mite or white fly or things like that, I'm going to be pretty conservative about spraying them with anything other than a strong jet of water this time of year. Why? Why don't I want to do that? Well, number one, you'd have to get out here pretty early to be able to spray in general because you definitely don't want to spray at high noon when it is really hot, when the foliage is under stress because all that's going to do is just burn the foliage. Number two, I really just think it kind of stresses the plant out even more 
just kind of let it be, let it try to attract or to attack those critters on its own. And the other thing is, there are beneficials out there that are just trying to survive. So don't try to spray, even with neem oil, with a pyrethrin, with an insecticidal soap. This time of year, I pretty much not only will let my insect, beautiful insect wildlife alone, I'm pretty, even the, even the nefarious creatures, I'm just gonna kind of let them alone too. I can tackle them later. There are enough other things that I can do in the garden besides just getting out my big guns and spraying them. So a strong jet of water this time of year is pretty much all I'm going to do. Now I'm sure I'll get lots of comments from, from you that have reasons that this advice might be wrong. So it's, it's very much an instance of know thy garden, know thy conditions, know thy geography, know, um, know thy pollinators and what want to live in your area because that will inform best practices or not because it's all about these don'ts are all about first do no harm it's that hippocratic oath first do no harm before you come in and you try to redress problems and you make them even worse so the good the good thing is it's too hot to be out here anyway so just give yourself permission not to address kinds of issues that you might have addressed earlier in the season just give yourselves a break give your pollinators a break and just kind of look and see what what amazing things mother nature can do to handle things on their own. Linda, we need to give that butterfly a raise. We do need, yes. He's performing uh, well. Yes, a bonus. Oh my gosh, I know, and there's been a couple of them. Have you seen the <laughs> Yeah, they've been flying around you the whole time. <laughs> and and before, we ca before we came over here, there was a huge, they're just, the monarchs have been here for a few days. Um, Oh, is that a big one? There's a swallow. There's a couple of swallowtails in here that I have also seen this morning, but it may be they may have moved on. It may be getting a little too hot up here on the upper terrace. I've also seen some sphinx moths, which normally I don't see this time of year. Um, they are the moth form of the tomato hornworm. Um, but there's also so many of the tiny little moths, tiny little butterflies, tiny little pollinators. I've seen dragonflies. I've seen, oh my gosh, I have seen so many. I don't know that we've captured them, Stuart. I don't know that we've captured them on film for their moment, like we're capturing these butterflies. And now there's something else hovering around it. Um, uh, but uh, I've seen so many praying mantises. Wow. Oh my goodness, I've seen... It's doing circles around Is it doing circles around me? Am I like Remedius the Beauty in uh, 100 Days of Solitude, Marcia Marquez, Gabrielle Marcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. Remedius the Beauty was always surrounded by yellow butterflies. So... Um, Leah was saying that I, I called the other fairy tale, the, fairy, the other house, the fairy tale house. Uh, but this is truly, I am seeing bugs out here I don't even recognize. I'm seeing some wasps that are like almost black. I've never even seen them before. And, and trust me, I, I don't worry about the wasps. They, I leave them alone, they leave me, leave me alone. But they too are pollinators. Everything leaves Linda alone. I, <laughs> <laughs> how dare they yeah how dare they I am I am boy I'm really getting off topic here but I am so fortunate that I am not allergic to things outside I'm not allergic to many po pollens I'm not I don't attract mosquitoes um, I I what else I I'm just really pretty lucky so I, I guess I was truly born to be a gardener. It literally, it literally is in my DNA. Let's stop for a moment to admire the Gara. 
which is just coming into bloom. And you guys, um, you were the ones that told me to just be patient because I am so impatient, um, but that I would get a second flush of bloom. And indeed I am, and happily it's coming out when not much else is blooming. And can I also say how pretty it looks? What a great combo this is. Okay, Leah, let's record this as a great combo for Instagram and in our newsletter because I love the delicacy of the gara and the strappiness of it and the real floral nature of the umbral form of the pentas. How beautiful are those, the white pentas? And by the way, these really benefit from deadheading and they have just been such troopers. I, I am going to record, if I already had my garden journal, here's my, my plug for my garden journal. If I already had it, I would definitely be recording in it that I am going to plant even more pentas and probably even more white pentas because I so love this little trio of the gara, the white pentas and this purple salvia which is on its third or fourth bloom because of, I know, because of its continual deadheading. Now, it's not in quite as uh, voluptuous a form as it was early in the season, but nevertheless, I think it just really looks beautiful. Um, and I am definitely doing the deadheading thing where I am deadheading it back. I am not shearing it back. So there you go. Thank you all. All the little critters, I feel like Snow White. Thank you. Yeah, really, thank you for your service. Um, and now, <laughs> I really got, I really took a side road there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my gosh. It's 100 degrees and they're just, if, if they can do it, we can do it. Let's move on to the next don't. Well, and my last don't is, in the process, uh, in the season, of admiring things like these gorgeous apricot zinnias, which are my favorite this year. I ha they are just beautiful. Thank you, Carolina Elizabeth, for sending me these little starts. I just love them. I'm obsessed by this color, this kind of, it, I don't know, it, it's very Oklahoma-ish, Oklahoma isn't it, Leah? It reminds me of, I don't know, red dirt and Sedona and just this, Southwest, it just reminds me of the Southwest and I, and I love it. Um, so in the process of admiring the things that are at their best right now, and zinnias really are, we don't want to forget about the seasons to come. So do not forget to order your bulbs from Color Blends. If you have not already done so, please make sure if you want to get the colors, the varieties, the selections that you want, make sure that you order them now. Do not forget. Now, in my most recent newsletter, we put what varieties I ordered and blends and blends of blends, alliums. We listed all the ones that I ordered from Color Blends. If you want to get that list, then just subscribe to www.lindavotter.com. Go there. Give me your email address and we will send you the newsletter that has not only my list of bulbs that I'm getting, but lots of other little tips and tricks and things like that. So definitely you're gonna to wanna to do that. But don't forget, don't deny yourself the, the sheer joy of not only the bulbs themselves when they bloom, but of the anticipation of their becoming uh, spectacular in the spring and the anticipation and the joy of selecting what varieties and what color palette you are going to magically create and make manifest in your gardens in the spring. So there you go. There are five don'ts that I really think we all want to heed this time of year. But here's a do, do stay hydrated, which I'm gonna do right now. And we are all gonna go in and get something cold to drink.